Well, Dallas, we're at it again. I believe this is this is episode seven. I know we've had some bonus ones, but this is officially like our, our seventh guest. We're kind of big time now. We're getting big time. Eight if you include me, but I'm like a lesser guest. Uh, you still count. You still count. But I think like we're, we're climbing. Every time we get a guest, it seems like we've increased like the performance or what they've accomplished already. So I'm, I'm feeling good about today. Yeah, my mom's going to love this one. <laughs> so our guest uh, has won a national championship with Defensive Volleyball Club. Current national team member. Uh, she played at Marquette, where she went from Rookie of the Year to Player of the Year in just one season. She played, like me, at multiple universities, so we got that going for us. Uh, reading her bio, there's a lot of awards on there. We couldn't cover them all, but I did notice she was an academic basically every year she played, and so that includes her Big Ten accomplishments and then her Big East accomplishments with Michigan State. Welcome and to the show, Autumn Bailey. Autumn Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> So your NCAA bio was way too long, so we, we picked out the ones we wanted to cover. There's too many things that you won, so... Uh, the transfer made it a little, a little more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> nice, so uh, fill us in. Where are you? When did you get home from pro? Uh, what's new? I am currently in Vancouver and training with a national team, like you said. Um, I got here just over two weeks ago, and uh, yeah, from pro I got back like April 23rd-ish, spent like six or seven days at home and then flew out to Vancouver. So it was a quick turnaround, but happy to be here. Nice. So you guys just finished tryouts and I guess you're, you're there for the long haul, like for the summer at least. Yeah. Yeah. Tryouts for, um, yeah, just at the end of April too. And, uh, so they just confirmed and selected the team last, uh, Friday, like officially. And yeah, so then we'll be here for the whole summer. So are these open tryouts like they have in, in Beach where anybody can sort of register and come in or do you have to be invited for, for senior camps like this? Um, the past two years they've done open tryouts so anybody could attend and uh, like last year I think there was close to 100 girls. Um, but this year he had like open tryouts but then a lot of the returning players um, didn't actually go out to the, the tryouts because they were getting back from pro season so like I didn't make it out for the tryouts this year but um, yeah, so it was open, but also returning players. So it's a lot like university sort of. tryouts where there's sort of like a formality and the people who are on the team, the coach will go, Hey, okay. Like, don't like, you know, come shag balls, but you're, you're good to go. Right. And I think some of the girls, uh, did actually try out a little bit, um, like maybe a couple days or whatever it was. But, um, also once you were on the team, some people had like extended tryouts and, um, he was still kind of watching throughout the week, so nobody was really uh, secure on the A-team either, especially having a new coach. So Yeah, we're actually going to jump into that as well. So having a new coach with the program, how has that been in terms of, like, I'm sure he obviously knows you, he knows all your accomplishments, but there hasn't been that face-to-face -face interaction, there hasn't been that rapport with any of the girls. How is that transition coming in, having a new coach, a new country, a new program. Tell us more about that. Well, actually, yeah, he reached out to all of us when we were over in pro. So um, he was, like, FaceTiming us. I FaceTimed him twice, which was super cool just to kind of, like, uh, yeah, put a face to the name and get to talk to him a little bit. And uh, But the transition's been, like, amazing. Um, all the staff is super great. We have, like, I don't know, probably, like, five coaches. And just uh, their technical feedback is so good, and the environment has been amazing. It's been super fun so far this summer. Nice. Awesome. So, yeah, for our listeners at home, uh, Tom Black is the new coach, and he has worked with uh, the United States. I think he was at the last Olympics with the women's team, and now he's currently in Georgia. And it looks like um, he went with a lot of players he knows, right, with an NCAA background. It looks like the roster you guys announced is a lot of NCAA athletes. Um, are a lot of them from your age group? Do you remember playing against a lot of your now teammates? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Shina and I, for example, played against each other every year in college, which was pretty crazy because we were in different conferences. And then, uh, yeah, there's a few girls um, who, like, we all range uh, in age, but I played some of them when I was a freshman and some of them when I was a little bit older. But, yeah, I remember even playing them in club, too, so it's been kind of cool. Nice. And what's the mood around training right now? Because you guys just had a red and white game, and now you're gearing up. Uh, you'll have your first international competition coming up in Quebec, right? So, uh Nice yeah. to have a, a women's competition on home soil. So what's what's practice been like? What are you guys looking forward to? Yeah, practices have been great. We're learning a ton. Um, just a lot of new technical stuff, but it's all been really good. And um, a lot of film and busy days, like super long days, but um, really, really important. And uh, then also, yeah, I don't know, the environment's been 
uh, exciting and um, just super positive for the most part. Like, yeah, we had our red and white scrimmage, and um, it was exciting too. We had a decent crowd come out and watch, and everyone's looking forward to it. Tom has always on the board, like, how many days till the next competition, and um, so you just kind of see it ticking down as we practice every day. But it's good to see, and he talks every day too about getting, like, 2% better. So it just kind of keeps you mindful, and um, their yeah, practices have been really good for the most part. So when we had TJ on here earlier, he gave us a bit of a rundown on what every day is like for him when he was with the FTC and how that transitioned to being on the senior team. Take us through a normal day in Richmond with you being on the senior national team in terms of you wake up, what you eat, practice, weight lifts, like all of that. Yeah. Um, well, right now, yeah, the days have been pretty packed, um, but usually I get up around 6.30, um, I'm not a huge breakfast eater, but I've been force feeding myself because we have like four hour long practices. But um, yeah, I usually eat like avocado and toast, which is kind of basic, I guess. But oh, I, um, <laughs> I, do, <laughs> I do that. And then uh, we head out to practice around 7.30 ish. And um, then we'll start kind of passing and um, just playing some short court games at around 8 start the official one up at 8.30, and then we get into it. Um, usually we finish right now around 12. So, there, yeah, like I said, long days, but we get into play in the morning, which is kind of nice. Um, you can rest your body a little bit longer before the next day. Um, and then we have, like, a two- to three-hour lunch break, and usually we have meetings with the coaches. At least these past two weeks we've had, like, meetings with coaches or um, some therapy or rehab. Um and then we start up usually skills at 3 o'clock, and we usually do split groups. So for, like, 40 minutes to an hour, we'll do just ball control. Like, the other day, we got to practice pancakes, which was pretty sweet. And uh, then after that, we'll go lift for a little bit. And um, then on Mondays and Wednesdays, we have mindfulness. Um, that goes from 4 to 5 or 4.30 to 5.30. And then we're finished usually after that. So, so you get hashtag mindful Mondays. Yes, Mindful Monday and Wednesdays. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so then we get home around 6, 6.30 and usually asleep by 10.30. <laughs> so it's a heavy load, it seems like, with a four-hour yeah. practice. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I We had two-hour practices with the beach program, and I think after, like, an hour and a half, I'm thinking, like, okay, like, we've, we've been going at this for a long time. With four hours, like... <laughs> What are you What are you doing for four hours? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, the first day I was pretty long, but you know, it's actually like I was saying last week. It's fairly like an entertaining practice. We'll start with just like skill work, and it's really individual. They break up the courts and just some like competitive little games. I know serving games and passing games, and then um, we'll do. They call it like tutors. They put us in like hitting tutors or passing tutors, and. Um, then we go do the skills, and then we watch our own video, kind of replaying, and um, then after that, we play for an hour, at least, of some sort of competitive, like, wash drill. So, I don't know, it actually passes quickly, but, yeah, it sounds like a really long yeah, practice. <laughs> so, what's the difference with that load with the national team than the load that you experienced with uh, overseas in Turkey? Um, it was fairly similar. We definitely had smaller, like, shorter practices in pro, especially by the end. Um, we'd usually go like an hour, serve and pass in the morning and then, uh, lift for an hour and a half. And then at night, like probably around three o'clock, we'd have like a two and a half hour practice. And that one we'd play most of the, we'd probably play for like an hour and a half at least. So of the practice, maybe even close to two hours. So I'd say it's more gameplay, but, uh, also we weren't learning as much technical stuff. So right, right, right. it's different. Nice. Uh, so a lot of our listeners are, are either coaches or pretty heavily involved in volleyball. I was wondering if you could let us in behind the curtain a little bit. You, like you talked about mindfulness. Like what does that actually look like in a practice environment? Or what are, what are some of Tom and the other coaches' feedback when they're talking about like, I think coaches all are aware of like the word process, but I don't think we actually know what it looks like in like a professional environment. I was wondering if you could share a, a couple house secrets for our listeners. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, I mean, Tom is huge on mindfulness and just getting like the most of every rep especially being new, um, and he's all about the process just because um, it's going to be a process, and he's, he's yeah, he's brand new with us, and we're learning his um, 
kind of how he wants us to play the game and all this. So it's kind of this understanding that uh, it's not going to happen right away. And it's been huge for me this past two weeks. I'm learning kind of a new passing form. And it's super strange. And I was terrible when I first got here at it and felt pretty bad about it. But um, he's been understanding. And, yeah, the coaches just have this kind of general um, – awareness that everyone's kind of going to get take a couple steps back before they actually improve and um, take steps forward but you're kind of seeing that turnover now and everyone's starting to take those steps forward and it's looking a lot better and you see people before last like last two weeks have been thinking so much like you know about their steps or what they're supposed to be doing and now people are starting to get it and uh just not even thinking it's just kind of clicking so it's good to see but um yeah mindfulness like also is so huge at practice just because um, yeah, they're constantly reminding you about like each rep we're doing and Tom will stop practice and call us in and say like, kind of just mention like, oh, we have 74 days or whatever it is till this tournament. And like, are you getting the most of this rep right now? Because it's just not worth it. Like, what's the point in doing a half decent rep when, you know, it's, it's just kind of a waste of your time, especially if we're going to be here so long, like we can get the most out of it. So just really, um, like challenges us to be mindful throughout all, pra- all of practice, which, um, is difficult, especially playing at the end of it, um, like by the end of the three and a half or three hours, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, it's definitely super important and it's worth being patient to see the results after your patience, which I've really had to work on these past couple of weeks. Nice, nice. Yeah, I think as a coach, the hardest thing with the process thing is just to be consistent because you want to you wanna do it now. And I mean, you guys mentioned you have about 70 days still competition, right? So yeah. I, I bet you they, they have a plan and everything's laid out really well. So yeah here's hoping here's hoping yeah (laughs) awesome um we did want to circle back just to cover all your youth stuff because again there is there's a lot to cover so thank you for sharing all that stuff but uh let's jump back into the high school days you shared a a video with us um you you were quite the big deal at offset a few competitions um what what caused this autumn trend for you to be trending in in strangers gyms and visiting school high schools honestly i don't know we were at offset i think we were in london that year and uh well it's pretty funny because we had 10 girls on the roster and i have three sisters and Three out of the four of us were on the team at the time. And then my two cousins, who are also also of the last name Bailey, were also on the team. So they went in this announce, like they were announcing our names, and it was five out of the ten girls were Bailey. So it was pretty strange. But, yeah, I don't know what the whole big deal was, but um, they had a good crowd at this one gym, and they were excited, and it was loud. It was a good environment to play in. But, yeah, I really don't know what the whole big deal was, but it was cool. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I can share the video, but I'll set it up. They're doing the introduction, and they're doing the standard, like, you get your two claps, and then they go Autumn Bailey, and the roof explodes on this place, and I message you, and I was thinking, like, oh, that's, like, your home gym, and you're a big deal at your school. Like, no, those, those are all strangers. I had no idea who those people were. There's 200 people just losing their minds. <laughs> you're Insta-famous before Instagram. Yeah, I don't even, I wasn't sure what that, I was not expecting that at all, but it was kind of cool. Huge pop in the rest of Huge world. pop. <laughs> Autumn's music hit and the crowd had nuts. <laughs> awesome. So one thing I always remember about uh, seeing you at OVAs and, and at, on the beach and even at uh, Nationals a little bit, you had one of the most wicked arm swings I think I've ever seen. Is that a credit to your mom and your baseball background or where did where did this arm swing come from? Uh, you know, I think that it's maybe kind of stemmed from playing baseball, but um I started when I was four years old. My dad actually played a summer with the national team. He was pitching for the national team for baseball. So he started all of us when we were like four or five years old. And um, I played like kind of all-star, like some house league, whatever, um, until I was about 16 and tried to play them both during the summer with beach volleyball, but couldn't really keep up with both. So I ended up choosing beach volleyball. But yeah, I think I learned kind of just how to throw a ball at a young age and that developed it and it just kind of translated to volleyball it was it felt natural to do it just like i threw a ball so i think that's where it came from nice so your dad deserves the credit i was good ready to give it to wendy but that's okay <laughs> no, you talked a lot about uh technical stuff and and reworking technical stuff now if tom starts reworking your arm swing we're gonna have to get him on the horn here and have a serious <laughs> he serious talking yet, to no. <laughs> Passing form, you've been doing that since, like, yeah, you started volleyball, we worked that, but the arm swing, don't touch it. Tom, you don't know us, we've got a lot of opinions you're about to hear. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> nice. So you you were growing up in the Burlington area, which happens to be home of Rob Fernley and the Defensive Volleyball Club. Uh, let's jump in there because you guys got some pretty wild stories. You won two national championships. You got a silver medal. Uh, what was it like playing for Rob? And I think every athlete on your team went to the NCAA your 18 new year. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. There were only eight of us, which was pretty crazy. But um, we managed to stay injury-free, which was lucky that year. But yeah, all eight of the girls went to the NCAA, which was super cool. So what's Rob doing over there at Defensa that keeps pumping out these these athletes that are ready to go to the NCAA? Um, yeah, I actually like credit Rob to a lot of um, my skill and just kind of like uh, the player I've become just because he's so invested in technically improving players. And it's easy to just kind of like, um, I think, let players, um, maybe it's not, maybe not technically sound with their skills, but you can get away with it sometimes in club. But when you get to, um, to the higher levels, it's important to be technically sound, which I'm definitely learning even more so now. But um, he spends like the time. I remember working on transition for so long, which is like maybe the most boring thing to work on, but it's so important. So um, just kind of those little little details. He was so big on um, all through club, so uh, that helped me a lot. But yeah, he's he's done that and he's kind of stuck with that um, all through defensa and. Uh, it helps a lot of people out, yeah. Nice, and explain this 18U uh, thing where you guys represented Quebec at Nationals. How did uh, how did that go down? <laughs> yeah, that was weird. We played in the um, NCAA, or not the NCAA, sorry, we played in the States a lot that year, so we actually missed Ontario Provincials, and we wanted to qualify for our Canadian Nationals. So we were trying to find, well, the coaches were trying to find a way that we could still qualify for Nationals without... Um, it being in the Ontario Provincials. So for some strange reason, you're allowed to play in another uh, province's Provincials. So we signed up for Quebec Provincials and drove like six hours and played in them and we ended up winning them. So we qualified for Nationals and yeah, it was super strange. We had a really, like we got stuck in a snowstorm. We had to hitchhike with this super random man. It was really weird. <laughs> Now, did anybody in Quebec sort of give you guys any guff for coming in there and winning, even though, I mean, technically you're not from Quebec, but I mean, Burlington, Quebec is now apparently a thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't remember any, like, direct comments, but I'm sure there was a little bit of heat about it, but actually when we were in the national finals, like, probably four Quebec teams from um, this from real Quebec club came... Yeah, came with like their Quebec flags and we're waving them around in the audience and we took a picture with their flag after. It was so weird. <laughs> I can only imagine somebody from out west looking at the schedule like, oh, we're playing Quebec 1. Like, I have no idea who these people are. And then like Ontario people walk on court. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> nice. So you guys mentioned you went to the U.S. a lot. Um, is that what helped start the conversations with Marquette? Like what went into your recruiting process? Uh, yeah, like before, when I was probably like 14, 15, I didn't really know I wanted to play in the States. But once we started going down there and seeing the different schools, sometimes we visit schools when we are down there. And uh, I don't know, I just kind of opened my eyes up to that. And um, some of the girls who were in the 18 year team when I was 16, they had committed to different schools in the States. And I don't know, it was just kind of the next thing that I wanted to do. And, um, you know, playing in the States helped. We trained with some American clubs and saw girls who were going to some big schools and that's how it all kind of got started with Marquette. Um, and, and yeah, so then after, I think they saw me mostly at club tournaments around like Chicago or some of the big ones. So that helped me out. When you were in high school as well, how many would you say, like what was your, your podium of schools that you were considering before you decided to go to Marquette? Um, it kind of came down to, I was looking at Marquette a lot, and then I actually was looking at a school, um, one of our defense alumni, Michaela so she played national teams as well, but she was going to Samford, which is now Alabama, and I visited there, and I was, I really liked it, it was a small school, so I considered going there, but um, yeah, I don't know, Marquette was just, uh, it's small, yeah, well, sm small, I guess, compared to some of the big schools, but I had about 10,000 people, and I really liked the coach there, so that kind of made my decision for me, but yeah, it came down to those two. Nice. And did anything kind of shock you about the level there? Like once you got into, was there a big jump from club to Marquette? Like you guys made the tournament your first year, right? Yeah, we did. Um, I think more for me, the jump was kind of the speed of the game. Um, just like everyone is pretty good. So um, yeah, the speed was definitely faster. That was an adjustment, but after I adjusted, I don't think it was so shocking. A bigger jump for me was definitely when I transferred to the Big Ten because the blocks are 
quite large and humbling in that conference. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good segue. Uh, we're going to ask a question I think everybody and their mother knew was coming. What was your reasoning behind transferring schools? Um, I transferred schools as well, but I don't think it was much of a big deal as it as when you left because you had <laughs> such a, a strong start to your NCAA career with Marquette. And, uh, yeah, just take us through that and sort of what was your, your reason behind it or, or how you think it, uh, it all panned out. Yeah, um, well, so after my second year, no, after, after my first year, my coach said um, that he was leaving. He was going to a Big Ten school. Um, he was going to Iowa, and I really, really loved him. It was one of the big reasons why I committed there. And so I kind of thought he asked me if I would maybe want to go also with him to Iowa and it kind of opened up my eyes to transferring in general. So I started thinking about it and the coach at Marquette, um, the new coach, he asked me to stay one more year and just give it a try. So I was like, okay, I'll stick around and try it out. And I really loved the school, so I didn't want to leave. But I did want to play the highest level I could play. So I stayed another year, and then I decided that it was time to go. And uh, was really interested in the Big Ten, so started looking at a few different schools there and looked at uh, Kentucky for a little bit, too. And, um, yeah, so that kind of sparked my transfer. And didn't end up going to Iowa with my coach, but um, just the Big Ten in general was kind of where I wanted to end up. Nice. And what made you pick Michigan State? Uh, it seems like every cycle they have Canadians, right? I think Fitterer was there when you were there, but Jazz White yeah. had just finished. A uh, friend of the show, Dana Cook, is an All-American there. Um, so what made you go to Michigan State? Go green. Yeah, go white. <laughs> I, um, yeah, when I visited, I just loved it. Um, Marquette was towers from home, and my parents came to a ton of games, which I was really grateful for. But um, it was super nice, just the idea of them being able to have a four-hour drive well, still playing the Big Ten, and there's like probably five other schools within six, seven hours that they were willing to drive to. So that was super appealing to me, and uh, just yeah, especially the Canadians. I knew Alyssa was there, so that was kind of a comforting um, factor. And uh, I, I felt like it was a place where I could go in and try to make a bit of a difference. And um, yeah, so that was probably all the things that were most appealing to me, and just to play, um, yeah, some of the best teams in the country so logistically what goes into a transfer policy like did all your credits for marquette transfer over uh did you have to sit any time before you could play again like what kind of went into like the timing of that decision yeah um so i transferred i decided to transfer in the spring of my uh, sophomore year and it was quite a difficult difficult process um there are some miscommunications at marquette that caused some problems and then um yeah, so when I transferred, um, not all my credits transferred over. Um, Marquette was a Jesuit judge, judge school. It's a tough word to say. Um, and so my, like, religion courses that I was um, had to take, they didn't transfer over. Um, so I was down, like, a whole bunch of credits. But um, kind of a blessing in disguise. I ended up, well, I didn't have to sit any time, but I ended up tearing my ACL in the first game. Well, I actually tore at Kentucky. Yeah, so I was deciding between Kentucky and Michigan State, chose Michigan State, went to Kentucky for the first game of the year and tore my ACL in the first match, which was brutal. But um, it gave me an extra year, and I was able to catch up on all my credits that I was behind on after that. So not really the best thing, but something good came out of it. So Yeah, the NCAA has a good – I mean, obviously – it's not good that you had an injury, but the NCAA has a good policy where if you don't play, I think, 20% of the matches that your team does, you can request to have your eligibility returned to you. Yeah, that's right. Nice. Um, so let's touch on that injury thing because, again, a lot of our viewers, the, this is good information because I think a lot of people that go through injuries, they don't realize how, how tough it is to... So obviously the, the physical thing, like the sport was taken away from you. Did you battle with any like identity issues now that you're not allowed to be in the gym? You're not jumping like volleyball had taken up most of your time since you were probably 14 years old. And now that's taken away. Like, how did you kind of navigate that situation? And do you have any tips for somebody going through the same thing? Um, that was the most difficult. Um, it was 10 months recovery. So um, it's, they told me like, you can get back in eight, you can get back in six, sometimes or whatever it was, but it took 10 solid months, which was good because I healed it up well and didn't have any problems, rehabbed really hard. But um, yeah, identity, like identity crisis really. Like I, I didn't know 
like I've spent since I was 10 years old playing competitive volleyball it was like what what am I doing like I don't I really didn't know who I was like I didn't have any other interests really I didn't have any like hobbies I just kind of sat around I felt pretty useless and uh, mentally that affected me a lot um I I struggled a lot that year um and yeah, I guess, um, yeah, physically it's hard, but mentally I would even say it's harder, which you hear, but um, it's hard to understand that until you really go through it. But um, my advice would be to, like, reach out to people because I didn't. I think, especially as athletes, we think you can handle things on your own and you're tough and you're supposed to be tough and go through all these things. And um, everyone kind of says, like, hey, you're going to come back stronger than before. And it's like, well, yeah, but what about right now? It's tough. <laughs> so, um I would say, like, I ended up seeing a sports psychologist, and I was super reluctant to do that because I was like, that's so kind of weak, like, I can handle this on my own. And when I did, it was, like, cha- it changed the whole um, the whole process. Like, my mindset was different, and I just felt, like, positive about it, and that it was okay. The things I was going through were okay and understandable, and other people have gone through them. And, yeah, it's okay not to know who you are. You've been a volleyball player your whole life. It's hard to know sp- I don't know, it was great to talk to him, and I have a lot of respect for um, the psychologist I saw and helped a lot. So seems like um, he did his maybe job. something that's difficult to do, but yeah, he did, for sure. It, it changed everything, so it was really great. That's awesome to hear. And it's it's good that you have that uh, that outlet to, to talk to someone and, and, and to vent to and to you know really figure out what's going on in terms of everything I think – I come from the place in beach where there's so many things going on. I think you really need to be mindful and take care of the stuff off the court in order for you to succeed on the court. Yeah, that's for sure. That was huge with that too. Just going through it all and even coming back my next year, like I was not good. And that was huge. Um, I mean, like to be back playing and you finally think after 10 months you're back and everything's going to be great again and you're going to have your identity back and to find out you're not so good at volleyball right now it was like well for one super humbling and two um frustrating and you question everything and you doubt yourself so much so um yeah definitely being mindful and you have to handle a lot of things in order to be back at what you want to be back and playing how you want to play so when tom comes up and says are you mindful you can sort of hey tom i, I got this <laughs> don't worry about leave it. me alone okay. i got this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So you touched on it earlier about uh, just the the speed of the game was one thing when you first went to the NCAA, but the size uh, kind of impressed you at, at the Big Ten when you're playing against, say, let's just name some of the schools you would have played on a regular. It would have been like Penn State, uh, Michigan's State, a big Illinois, rival. Nebraska, um, Ohio State. Um, yeah, uh, I can't even think of them right now, but yeah, like Northwestern. Um, yeah, but Penn State, uh, Nebraska, those were the Minnesota, some huge names. They always made it super far in the tournament, usually Final Fours. Rutgers is in there. <laughs> Rutgers was in there, yeah. Can't forget about them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, try not to. <laughs> so uh, how did you adjust to that? Obviously, you had your, your new mindset coming back from an injury, but what kind of helped you get up to speed uh, coming back from injury and then playing against probably the best conference, if not one of the best conferences in women's volleyball? Yeah. Um, yeah, again, especially coming back from the injury, I actually saw the psychologist again the next year because the first two weekends I played brutally, like it was just terrible. And so I was like, am I, am I so bad right now because I came back from an injury or because this conference is so much better than me? And, um, I was super confused and yeah, like I said, doubting myself, but, um, it was an adjustment and it took some time to get back to playing like myself, but also the competition was just that much better. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It definitely took time in the gym adjusting. Like, I think the blocking, um, like the blockers were the hardest part for me to adjust to. The serving, like p- passing was um, difficult, but once we kind of got a hold on that, um, it improved. It. But hitting against these huge blockers, like I had to learn a whole bunch of new shots, like sharp cross and hitting deep and just kind of seeing the block. I think at Marquette more often I could kind of just swing blindly and it, it worked out sometimes for me. And then in the big time, it just wasn't the case, which um, was a good stepping stone for pro for sure. Um, but yeah, I had to learn like where the blockers were and hitting high hands. Yeah, hitting high hands was something I'd never really occurred to me before. And it was such a strange uh, idea, but it was extremely important now. So I'm glad that I was forced to do that. That's a good point. Uh, high hands rather than hard down. 
Yes, that is <laughs> something that was important because the harder you hit into the block, the harder you get blocked back. So, I mean, my favorite chirp was whenever I get blocked, I turned to them and said, "Man, I you have to be really strong to get blocked that hard." <laughs> yeah, that was, just, that was just a good. Hit. You have any idea how strong I am? You just blocked me that hard. <laughs> So, yeah. oh, I'll, no. sorry, I'll go, sorry. Uh, at Michigan <laughs> State, I guess you were, you got the benefit from probably one of the best rivalries in college sport. What was it like playing against Michigan? And do you and Jen Cross, do you talk at practice? Like, is there like a, an unspoken bond there that you just hate each other because of your school choices? Yeah, so I like didn't know much about the Michigan Michigan State rivalry before getting to Michigan State, but it's like bred into you as soon as you get there. Like, I mean, <laughs> it's like pretty serious. You, I mean, I don't want to say you hate the people at that school, but you don't like them. Like, it's bad. It and it's just super competitive and everything you do. And yeah, Jen and I butt heads a ton about our schools and are almost constantly in. Uh, just just making fun of each other or making comments with anything, any opportunity when our schools play each other, it's constant. So, But Jasmine White just joined the roster, so now there's two Spartans and just one Wolverine, so she's outnumbered right now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize how bad it was till Dallas and I went to that Leafs-Detroit game that was at the Big House, and I yeah. remember telling Dana Cook about this, and she was so disappointed that we were going to the Big House that the only yeah. way it was okay is if I punched a Wolverine in the face. Like, that was her only <laughs> rationale. It didn't happen, but I'm just saying. It's like, cringeworthy <laughs> that you hear that you guys were out there. <laughs> my uh, my favorite thing about that trip, too, is there's a player, Abdul Kader, who's from Detroit, plays for Detroit, and there was, what, 120,000 people at the game, and he was giving an interview, and he was booed, <laughs> like, yeah. religiously. <laughs> I'm not surprised. By the I'm home team, mi just because he went to Michigan State. I love how he finished the interview with a, a Go Green. And it was like, it off. was like, it, he could have said anything, and it wouldn't have been as bad as that. <laughs> so funny. Well, actually, like, before football games and stuff, um, people sign up to camp outside of our Spartan statue, like, literally camp out for a week. Um, just to defend the statue from like the Michigan people, which is just crazy, but it's awesome. And people walking around campus with like Michigan shirts or stuff are just, uh, it's just not good. You probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into particulars of what happens. Uh, you mentioned a big change from going from Marquette to the Big Ten. Uh, what do you think was the biggest change? whether it's culturally or the game that you experienced uh, overseas on your first trip playing, you know, pro. Uh, we've had Becky Pavin on here talking about going to the airport and, and not knowing who's picking her up, and, and she just sort of blindly gets into a car and goes, okay, I mean, my name's on a sign, so this has got to be legit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a culture shock for me, for sure. Um, and I had the same experience, like, getting to the airport and, I don't even know what time it is. I was in, first I stopped in Egypt, which was so strange, but ended up in um, Turkey and just got off. I had no clue who I was looking for. I just walked out my suitcases blindly. Some man was like waving at me. I was like, guess this is who I'm supposed to go with, I hope. I'm like, you have no idea. So I just got in their car and made it back, luckily. But, uh, and they barely spoke English, so it was like, this is a real toss up here, but we're going to go for it. But, uh, yeah. So, but culture shock for sure was huge. Like Turkey's culture is so different than Canada and America. And, um, it was uh, an adjustment for a few months for sure. What was the biggest thing that stood out for you? Your first say month there where you sort of realized you go, Oh, okay. This is different. <laughs> um, Huh. Okay, first of all, most of my teammates, like probably four of them spoke English fluently, and my coach did, but like the other girls didn't. And it was like, okay, so when they say you don't have to be like friends with your teammates, like you really apparently don't have to be because I didn't even speak to these people. Like we couldn't communicate, so that was crazy. But um, culturally, like in Turkey, the prayer song, I think it goes off six times a day, it's at 6.30 in the morning. So for the first, like, two months, um, I was up at, like, 6.30 with the prayer song. Um, and it goes around the whole country. How do, they, how do they distribute that? Like, on the um, radio? It's on, or like, loudspeakers. Um, and they're, like, everywhere. Like, there's one outside my apartment. Like, they're just kind of everywhere. You almost always can hear it. Um, yeah. Not, like, when we're in the gym, but when you're outside in your apartment, you can almost always hear it. Um, and it's very loud. Um, 
but there was that and just the food is pretty different um and so I'd adjust to that but other than that yeah it's just like a pretty religious country for the most part and the men are like a little bit more dominant I would say um in that country and so that was also different for me um and yeah so just the kind of those things and once I got adjusted it was okay but still different it was good to be back in Canada but uh yeah just different TJ brought up a funny story about every time he plays uh, Iran, there would always be someone writing in Arabic and nobody really knows what it would say. Did you have any, like, um, we'll call it social media, um, what are we, interactions <laughs> yeah. where you had to step back and laugh and say, okay, I don't know if this sort of makes any sense, but I'm sure that was either nice or I'm sure that was supposed to be me. And yeah, there was actually, like, uh, a decent amount of those, like, people commenting on things or <laughs> writing you messages on Instagram or Facebook or whatever it was in Turkish, and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to translate this. There's a little option for translate at the bottom, so I'd click it, and it'd be, like, the most broken English or, I don't know, just some pretty weird translations. You're like, okay, I don't know what that means, but okay. <laughs> Your cereal is too cold. Ah, <laughs> <So> okay. <really>. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. And what's the level like in Turkey? Uh, did you have to make a jump from where you were with the Big Ten to like the skill level there? What's it like? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, Turkey is one of the strongest leagues right now um, in the world. And so playing against some top players like um, Tiana Boscovic, um, Kim Young. Uh, um, yeah, I don't, there's a lot of girls there um, who are on like top national teams and do really well. Um, so playing against them was an adjustment. Uh, I got hit over top of fairly often um, by some of these like six, five girls. But um, that was kind of like the big ten too. So that was the big difference. But uh, definitely still like the blocking and I would say serving that was difficult for me. Not my serving, my passing was difficult. Um, uh, the serves are just like a level up even. Um, and some of the best servers in the world were in that conference, so or in the league, sorry. So um, that took some time to get used to. Um, but yeah, hitting against these big blocks. One, uh, one of the best blockers in the world played for uh, Fenerbahce, and she plays on the Turkish national team. And she blocked me pretty hard back in my face a few times, like pretty hard. So, so your strength and conditioning experience. program is working well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. That's pretty much it. So you have this, we'll say, summer with, with the national team, and, and that's going to be a good lead-up into your, your next year in pro. Um, do you know where you're heading off next year, or do you have any, uh, we'll say, I don't know, I'm losing my words today. Do you have any uh, hope of where you'll end up in terms of what country or what league, or yeah. you know, you tell your agent where you want to go? Yeah, I right now I haven't signed anywhere. Um, I'm looking at a couple of teams uh, in Italy and then um, Turkey again. Um, I would like to play in Italy if I could. Um, I think it'd be a super nice place to live um, for sure. And Who's better? it's a it's a good league too. It's also one of the top leagues in the world. So I think it would be good to get my foot in there and start trying to work my way up um, in the teams in that league. So I would like that a lot if that could work out. Um, but other than that, yeah, looking at some different teams in Turkey also. Um, those are probably my two primary options right nice. now. Now, are clubs approaching your agent about your free agency, or is there a way for your agent to contact and say, hey, I noticed you have a spot on the left side. Autumn would be really interested. Like, is there a bit of back and forth, or how do, how do you end up with these offers? Um, yeah, right now I think mostly the clubs are reaching out to my agent, and then he relays that to me. Um, but I think, like, if he knew of, um, he's Turkish, so I think if he knows of, like, a team that needs an outside that he could put my name forward, and, uh, I wouldn't mind that for some of the, uh, Italian teams, um, so I think it kind of goes both ways, yeah. And do you ever offer, like, package deals where you say you have a really good, you know, you mentioned Jasmine being uh, a Michigan State alumni too. Would you ever approach your agent and say, hey, listen, I want to, like, I don't want to leave. I want to have someone with me, package us together and send us off to the same team? Or does that happen often? Or is it sort of everyone's out for their own in terms of getting contracts? Um, I think more often than not, everyone's kind of out for their, on their own trying to get contracts. But, um, 
too. Like, I know some teams are looking at um, different players on my team now, and so it wouldn't be a bad thing to go with another Canadian and just have, like, a built-in friend or someone to speak to in English <laughs> while you're there. So I don't think it's, like, um, like too frequent that that happens, but it would definitely be a bonus if it could be. Cool. Nice. Uh, so I think this brings us back to the Team Canada thing. So you guys have a competition in Quebec, and then you've got an Olympic qualifier this summer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we uh, do. So you guys have taken a pretty big roster right now, and then you'll you'll shrink it. I guess how many athletes can make that Olympic qualifying tournament? Like, would you take a roster of twenty, or what do you have to shrink it down to? Um, you know, I'm not actually sure what the answer is. But last year for the World Championships, we took fourteen girls. So I imagine it would be something similar to that. Um, but yeah, I don't know the answer to that for sure. But yeah, those are the big tournaments coming up: the VNL qualifier, and then uh, if we do well in that, we'll play at the end of. June as well in another VNL qualifier and then kind of after that we have the Pan Am Cup and yeah then the Olympic qualifier so some big tournaments this summer to look forward to. Nice and what's the mood around the program right now because you've experienced I think this is your third coach because you would have been a youth athlete when Lupo was still around were you around the program at that time? Yeah and I played junior national team when I was there so he didn't actually coach me but he was in the gym um, here and there so I did meet him but was never really coached by him but yeah my second officially with the program nice so you're kind of technically on your third coach and you were part of the youth movement that kind of moved in so uh is everybody kind of in the same boat or do you guys rely on like um jen cross to kind of be a leader or richie to be a leader like what's the dynamic along with the with the team because you do have some vets and you do have some girls who are still in their post-secondary careers right yeah yeah the age range is huge but um yeah i would say we look up to the older girls still a lot um just they have so much experience internationally, which even after playing a year of pro, I still don't have like, um, I still don't totally know. Like I go to Kyla for a ton of advice about pro and um, just in general, she's had so much experience in general. And uh, yeah, so I think um, we look to them a lot, but also everyone, um, the young girls bring a lot too. So um, I think it's like a pretty equal playing field. Um, everyone respects each other and um, looks to each other I don't know, um, on the court. And so I think, yeah, it's fairly equal, but definitely have some leaders in the older girls. Nice. And are, are courts separated? Cause you guys did take a big group of uh, next gen athletes too. Are they mixed in with the seniors or how does that work? Um, we practice separately right now. So, um, they usually practice after us in the mornings. Um, and we lift at different times also, but for like mindfulness meetings, we, um, were with them and also any like team bonding. We went bowling this past weekend and, uh, we do that kind of thing together too. So, so you it's all nice can sit at the same lunch party. table. Pardon? You can all sit at the same lunch table. Exactly. You're not yeah, saying, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I think that's separate, awesome yeah. when you have like 30 or 40 athletes together that you at least know everybody's name and you can speak to them or maybe yeah. you go bowling. I think that's a really good dynamic that the national team's building. Yeah, I want to be really on this nice team. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. I want to go bowling. It's like a feeder team into, which is exactly what they want to do. So I think that's really awesome and good culture and gives people opportunities. No, that uh, that sounds great. It sounds like the, it's a good bunch of girls, and everybody seems to be on the same page. Coach is on yeah. the same page, and uh, you know we're we're pulling for you on this side, and we, and we know you guys are going to do great things in the VNL this yeah, year. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so. We're going to take some big steps forward this summer for sure. Well, we wish you nothing but the best, but uh, we do want you to know that beach is always an option if you ever want to come back to the beach. <laughs> I will be back, that's for sure. Yes! yes. yes. I don't know how much team bonding you'll have, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's always kind of been the plan. I want to come back to beach. I'm not sure when. I, I've tried to think about it, but it's hard to know with so many unknowns with indoor, but eventually I will be back to the beach. That's, don't worry. That's there's a whole more. Country. There's a whole other branch of unknowns when beach comes into play. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that too. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay, so just uh, to help everybody, you know, come and see how great you guys are doing in Quebec, where is it, when is it, and how can people get tickets to come and see you? Um, it is in, okay, I don't want to mispronounce this, but Chateauguay, I think it's called, it, that's in Quebec, and um, I believe we start playing on the 27th till, or maybe, the, yeah, the 27th or the 30th till the 2nd, um, and then I know you can get tickets on Volleyball Canada, um, and... Yeah, a ton of my family is going to be there and a lot of people's families, so I think it's going to be a really good event. So that's a good way to see Quebec volleyball alumni Autumn Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hopefully, I'm Making her hometown <laughs> return. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, no, that's great. And uh, we'll be sure to pump that out to make sure we get uh, as many fans there as possible. But uh, thanks for coming on. And we know you got practice now, so we'll give you a bit of time. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. It's great. been fun. Awesome. Thanks so much, Autumn. All right. Talk to you later. Take care. <laughs> Friends of the show, we hope you enjoyed that amazing episode with Autumn Bailey. Uh, if you haven't already, feel free to check out previous episodes where we had great guests like TJ Sanders, Eric Matson, Becky Pavin, Jesse Elser, Seymour and Jody Z, Jake McNeil, or even episode one where Dallas Keith announced his retirement from beach volleyball and became the star of the show. Also, if you have time, feel free to give us a review on iTunes and leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you guys. And the nicest compliment you can give to the show is just by telling a friend and help spreading the word about passing times. Stay excellent, everybody. All right, Dallas, we're back. I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. The the chaos and awesomeness that was Indoor Nationals kind of threw our schedule off there. We're back, and we're back in business here. Good. You? Ah, uh, you know, passing dimes. <laughs> you know what? I will say, I didn't really miss you. I missed us. Ah. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I think you took the words out of the viewer mouth. Exactly. Exactly. So... We were running around Nationals. We got the Eric Matson episode that's up. We got a Seymour one. Uh, lucky to run into Jesse Elser. Like, there were so many people in Indoor Nationals. I had a great time. How was your experience? It was great. It was great to see a bunch of people. It was great to see that, you know, 10 years have gone by since I played in Club Nationals and not a single bit of the culture has changed once. And that's that's good, but that's also kind of like there's a few things that I wish we could uh, iron out. But that's okay. It is it is what it is at this point. Beggars can't be choosers, but you know what? We can still give our opinions on podcasts. Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> uh, before we get into it, I would just one first of all like to thank the staff at Volleyball Canada for getting us a media pass and a quiet space to record in. Uh, so of course we're talking about you, Jackie. Sandra and Courtney, thank you so much for being so accommodating. Uh, you guys were running a great event and took the time to kind of make sure we had everything we need. So we, we definitely appreciate that. Uh, and we'd also like to thank Autumn Bailey for just giving an awesome interview. That was that was great. I knew she was an awesome volleyball player and she was a jokester on the beach tour running around with Rivera, her partner. But uh, I didn't know she'd give such an awesome interview. It's nice to see good people, good interviews, good times. Really excited for the women's indoor national team. Uh, obviously, Tom Black, a new coach in place there, but... Looks like they got a youth movement. They they've held on to some valuable vets. They've they've got some big competitions going on, and wish them nothing but the best as the Olympic qualifier starts this summer. Speaking of big competition, Charles, big result on the beach front. It's a Pima four star, two medals on the women's side, a silver medal from Melissa Manu Perez and Sarah Pavin, and a bronze medal for Heather Banzi and Brandy Wilkerson. Amazing. Definitely amazing. It's too bad that they had to play each other in the semi. That could have been the final easily of the tournament. Um, what a high level of ball everybody's playing this early in the season. I'm not just the Canadian bias because I think our teams are amazing, but how good Kleinman has got in the last year. Like when she first came to the beach, it was kind of like, okay, like she's a dominant indoor player trying beach. She's legit now. Well, I don't know. I'm going to have to play devil's advocate and disagree here because her first FIVB event was a four star in the Netherlands, which they won. However, it was inside, and if you if you pay attention, they were losing the country quota match, and then somehow the fire alarm went off. I'm, I'm not saying there was anything to do with that, but then they come back and they just run the table. So her first game was a country quota, and it could have easily ended uh, two straight, but then fire alarm, Charlie ch chimed in, and bam. You're right. She had a real slow start to her FIVB career with winning a four-star. I'm just saying... That was inside. Did you see her when she played outside the first couple times? You know what? I had a old university coach that had this to say. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. The best part when you tell these stories is their identity is completely safe because you must have played for three universities. So at the time you say, <laughs> oh, my university coach used to say their identity is completely safe. It's like a one in three odds. Yeah, it could be anybody at this point. <laughs> could my, be made up. My old coach used to say this. You got a Rolodex of people that could be. Transitioning <laughs> back into what we were talking about, the Etipima Four Star Awesome results uh, for Brandy, Sarah, Mel, and Heather, but also awesome results for Megan and Nicole coming off of a national championship at UCLA. They come in, win the win the pool in uh, in their first, I think, four star in their first four star main draw, and uh, you know the level of uh, the level of competition at any four star is, I think, on par with a five star because there are so few five stars now that. Uh, 
it's good to see a next gen team really get a top 10 finish there. And I think everyone knows Megan and Nicole are ready, but there's still a few naysayers who say, oh, they need to get lucky with the draw. They need to do this. They beat a very good team from the Netherlands and then topped it up by beating a very good German team to win their pool. Yeah. Like they, they are tour ready. I'm excited to see what comes next. Uh, they're definitely making the Pan Am race super interesting because their first event out of the gates it got them 400 points. 400 points. So they we're still looking forward to that June deadline of when the Pan Am team will be awarded the bid. But they've definitely put their names into contention with just one tournament completed. On the men's side too, it's coming down to the wire uh, with... Grabowski, Whelan, Plantinga, Nussbaum all taking the same result in uh, in Brazil. I think it's something like a 20-point difference between the two, and uh, it comes down to, I think, it was supposed to come down to this tournament, but uh, looking at the registration on the FIVB, we see that both teams are registered in Greece for the one star, so it's going to come down to that as well. I think that's really important to showcase the depth we have right now that uh, I think everyone knew when this was announced, this format, the women's draw especially would be really challenging, that there was probably half a dozen teams that could go for it. But on the guys' side, it was kind of tiered where if Sam and Sam don't take it, if Ben and Grant don't take it, like I think Mike and Aaron had really positioned themselves as Canada 3, where this shows that it is pretty wide open. Uh, we talked about it earlier in a, in a previous episode. Cam and Sergey have an international medal already this year. Uh, it's coming down to the wire. I think it's, it's very exciting and shows that that our country's on the rise, not only on the women's side, who's getting four-star medals, but the guy's side is, is a lot of depth. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, that's less than a week, o or that's less than a week away. That's less than two weeks away from uh, from finding out who's going to be representing Canada in Lima, Peru. But uh, I think either way, whatever team we send, we, uh, we should be expecting at least a medal. And more exciting news on the guys' side, Ben and Grant, uh, they had a rough go to the start of the season, losing in the qualifier twice. Well, they came out of the gates and got a ninth. Uh, they were in tough. They were down. They lost their first match of pool play, and they were down like 21-20 in the second set, came back to win that, and then took the third, and just kind of rode the wave there for a bit. They were they were playing well. They're, I think they're finally getting comfortable or maybe getting the rust off from the offseason, but they can play. They're ready. They're ready, and uh, it's going to be fun to see what happens in China if uh, if they can continue that. And uh, you know, Sam and Sam playing playing good ball too. Unfortunately, bowing out in the first round against the Grimmel brothers, who seem to be the uh, the hot team to start the the twenty nineteen season. So, uh, I mean, I I I don't think I'm pulling any punches here when I when I say I think they're disappointed with the seventeenth, but. Uh, I mean, we have two teams that are definitely in the mix to uh, to get to a semifinal. I think Sam and Sam proved that in China last year, and and you know Grant and Ben have a have a tour win in Sydney um, at a two star event. But I think it's 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 good to see that their the trajectory is in a positive slope for both teams there. Yeah, and Sam and Sam have committed. I think they're going to be on the road for about five weeks here, so the hopefully the results just keep climbing. They're going to be gaining a lot of tournament experience here, and like you said, like. A couple weeks ago, they finished ninth, and it was kind of just like a, eh, like that's that's good. But that's I think, what you should be doing. Yeah, so they they are really close to getting to the quarterfinal, semifinal podium. Like we're we're rooting for them. They are they're on the cusp here. Yeah, and uh, I was in it's a team last year playing at this event, and Sam and Sam that was their that was their first quarterfinal at a big tournament. So uh, so it'll be good to see. And then uh, as you mentioned, they're on the road, and then they come back for a little hometown not hometown appearance in Edmonton for the three star. That's I'm so excited for that. Like every like you said, like we're already at the end of May. It, it's it's coming closer. I can't wait for the tournament list to come out. You can see that international teams are starting to sign up. Like it's it's becoming a little bit closer. I think we're we're under sixty days, I feel like, until that one, right? So the team list is starting to fill out. It's gonna be a good one. It's gonna be a good one. And we've already complimented the the great community in Alberta. Um, I touched on this in our interview with Jesse that'll come out shortly. Actually, no, it comes out after we're recording this, but before Autumn's the one. So, you know, we're in a bit of a time machine here, but, uh, the city of Calgary right now has so many boys volleyball players where in the 16 U division, Canuck played each other in the semifinal. One won the gold, one won the bronze after that was done. And then my team who was in a tier two quarter played against the Dinos. So just between that, having the first, third, and then I don't know how the draw works out, maybe 12th best team in the country at 16 boys shows that there's it's probably like 30 good indoor players playing there. And hopefully we can transfer some of those guys over to the beach. And that doesn't include Edmonton or any other community that's around the Alberta. That's just the city of Calgary. So this is amazing 
the, the volleyball boom that is happening in the province of Alberta. Maybe it's not even a boom. Maybe it's just they've been doing this for years and now I'm paying attention. Shout out to Don Sachs with the Volley Dome, who's been putting putting good uh, volleyball players in and out of that uh, realm for years now. There's a lot of second generation, because you mentioned Don and Ben and, and Camille, like the, the family there, but the Elser family is really involved. Um, Gavilis. Gavilis, his family's involved. Like the FTC for the men used to be in Calgary, and it looks like the guys who stuck around there and had their families there, all their children are, are dominating the youth scene right now. Powering through the youth scene right now. Uh, I do want to spotlight one thing that we ranted about. Um, I was upset that Alisson wasn't going to be in a Brazil four-star. Well, all of a sudden, Harley's not in the qualifier. Who do they sub in? Alisson. I think our show has a little bit of a poll where people started to look around. They're like, what? This can't be true. Did passing dimes just break another story? We must resolve this. We must get Alisson into the tournament. We actually flew to Itapema on the Brazilian Federation's dime. They had us consult who we thought should be in the four-star replacing Harley, and we gave our recommendations in a nine-page published thesis that you can read on our on our website. It was great there. We had a couple dinners. We met the original Ronaldo, not the Portugal one, the Brazil one, who was dominating the World Cup. He, he spilled out a little bit, lost some hair, but uh, still beauty. Yeah, I mean, he had a bad haircut now, and now that he's losing hair, he had to chop off whatever was going on in the back there, but it's good to see him. It was good to see all, you know, Ronaldinho and, and all those guys, so, you know what, we're really, we made it to the big time here. <laughs> uh, to move on in our international watch, two more top 10 finishes, this time on the women's side of the Turkey two-star. Man, Canada crushing with these top 10 finishes. So first of all, we got to give congratulations to Sophie Bukovic and Taylor Pischke, who made the semis. Unfortunately, finished with a fourth. That was a really tough draw there, um, the way it worked out. Really hoping that they could have got a medal, but you know what? We'll take a fourth. We'll take a fourth. We'll take a ninth, too, with MC and Amanda. That, uh, you know, as we talked about before, it gives the, M or it gives the uh, Pan Am watch a little bit... Uh, under a microscope, and it's good to see that we're, we're starting to hit our stride. Um, I think China is going to be the big one. It, uh, you know, it's never fun going to China in terms of the food, in terms of the travel. If you look at uh, some of the players' Instagram feeds, they're saying it's a 40-hour travel time between uh, Brazil and, where is it, Xiamen? I believe that's where we are, yes. Yeah, and... Uh, Ben Saxon, who's been playing for Canada for 15 years, said this was his longest travel day ever, going from Brazil to China. So, um, I mean, best of luck to all those teams there. Hopefully you, you packed a lot of snacks. Hopefully you can find someplace good to sleep. And, uh, and it, it'll be good to see what, what pans out with that tournament as well. What a life beach volleyball players lead. Like we, we, we see the glory on Instagram a lot about, you know, you're traveling, you're going to all these awesome countries, all this awesome food. 40 hours of travel, and I believe uh, looking on Pedlo's uh, social media, his last flight was delayed. So how defeating is that? You think like you're finally on the home stretch, we're going to get on this one, then I'm going to get to the hotel, I'm going to be able to get my meal in, get my lift in, get a nap in, and they're like, oh, sorry, sorry, your flight's delayed. It's now going to turn into like 45 hours of travel. So when I my biggest travel day, I think, was 30 hours going from... Um Toronto to Hong Kong to Sydney, Australia, and we had a five-hour layover in Hong Kong. That was 30 hours and a 16-hour flight and a... So it was 32 hours, a 16-hour flight and a 10-hour flight. You had another 10 hours to that trip? I mean, apart from your watch probably exploding from all the times zones you're going through, when you get there and you get off the plane, and it's not like you're in Australia or you're in, you know we'll say, Fiji or a cool place, you're in China. You're in a place that nobody really wants to be in. Food's not great. I hear the Pizza Hut's the place to be. But after all that, your flight's delayed. You, you're, you get off the plane and, all right, well, nobody speaks the language. The food sucks. And I'm going to be in a bed that is way too small for me. Even the travel, like, if you get, I'm thinking of, like, poor, like, Will Hoey-sized athletes on an airplane seat for that long. There's only so many naps you can take. There's only so many movies you can watch. This is just grueling. But on the other side of it, how lucky are they to live a lifestyle where they get to fly around the world playing volleyball? So I, I do I do empathize with the grind a little bit, but I do also think like they're pretty special. It is. You know what? And for any of the beach players that know me, when I traveled, I had a movie list that I would write down. I'd go, okay, I've never had the opportunity to watch these movies. Uh, I don't know what else I'm going to do with my time. I'm not going to sleep because I don't sleep on planes. Uh, 
I cannot tell you the amount of classic movies that I saw on a plane for the first time that I was like, oh my god, this is great. And you can just switch it up. I remember watching Pulp Fiction and then I, Tanya, and then the Lego movie back to back to back and thinking, wow, those were three great films. Okay, sweet. I only got four more movies to go until my flight's over. <laughs> oh, man. I wondered if we were to speak to other tournament-based athletes how they deal with the grind, like a golfer or a tennis player, but I feel like they are they might plan their schedule a little bit better. That I don't know who's in charge of the promoting, but to go from Brazil to China just shows that whoever made the schedule doesn't own a map. No, or has never been on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> so that is our international watch. Obviously, our senior teams are crushing it as we're on the podium on the women's side, a ninth and 17th on the guy's side, and then with the Pan Am watch... It's going to come down to the deadline, so I don't remember it off the top of my head. It is the middle of June. I feel like it's after the next four-star, which was either Warsaw or the Czech one. I forget off the top of my head. Do you remember? One. Yeah, I don't remember either. But it is coming down to it. That'll be exciting. I, I think the best thing is we're going to send the best team available. So whether that's the, the two seniors pull one out of the hat here and it, it's a bit of a wild card and they want to go to Pan Am, or it's the third Canadian team who's been grinding to get these points. So yeah. no matter what, we're going to have a team who's ready to go and, and really wants to do this. Yeah, I think nothing short of a medal should be the expectation. Um, you know, it was unfortunate last time at the Pan Ams on home soil that Binstock Schachter had an injury. I mean, that was our best team that we could have sent, and, and we sent them, and it's unfortunate. Um, just, you know, the circumstances of that. So it's good to see um, the result that's going to come for sure. And, and fans will remember Melissa and Taylor doing so well at Pan Am, and I think that was a big boost in their career to go to a multi-sport games, to be in an environment where you're expected to win. Uh, sure, they, they played some teams that were maybe lesser value, but when you're expected to win, that's a lot more pressure. And then when you do play like a top team like Cuba and you're in a battle like that, like I think it just it helps you so much further in your career to go to those multi-sport games and be on center court and, and really have to go for it. So... Um, yeah, I'm excited for whatever comes from this. This is this is a great experience for whoever gets it. Big shout out to the show. Uh, big shout out to the show. Big shout out to a friend of the show, Conrad Leineman and Jody Holden, who were the 1999 Pan Am champions Woo! when it was hosted in beautiful Winnipeg, Manitoba. So Canada has a history of winning this tournament, and I don't think uh, our expectations are too light when we say we expect uh, we expect a medal, if not a gold medal, from from one of the teams. Awesome. Awesome. What else do we need to cover this week? I mean, I think with all the bonus content and all that great stuff that we did at Nationals, the Eric Matson show, the the Seymour show, it was funny when, when you posted that, uh, I go, who in the hell is Craig Moore? Oh, it's Seymour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. But, uh, no, and just remember, if uh, for all the Instagram followers, if you follow us on Instagram, be sure to check us out on Podbeam and subscribe to the podcast. We will be releasing new content throughout the week and full episodes on Podbeam every Friday afternoon. So once again, follow us on Instagram, Pass and Dimes, but be sure to subscribe to us on Podbeam and, uh, and listen to full episodes every Friday. Awesome. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. Stay excellent.